Hello and let's talk about rapid testing and what happens after the lockdown. Earlier this week, we saw the controversy over the quality of rapid testing kits. The Indian Council of Medical Research cancelled the order it had placed for 5 lakh testing kits from China. This has called into question the testing strategy for the entire country. This is because the antibody testing was seen as a key component in the surveillance strategy of various states during the withdrawal of the lockdown. This is the latest concern on the mind of experts as we begin to discuss how to exit the strict lockdown we have endured for over a month. What are the steps we need to take? And how do we ensure a balance between the needs of millions who are struggling with poverty as well as their health? We talked to Dr. Yogesh Jain of Jan Swasti Sahyog on these issues, beginning with the impact of the cancellation of the order for testing kits. Do you think that this is going to probably have an impact on our larger preparedness itself because rapid testing was seen as one of the key components uh, at least by many states definitely in evaluating the status of the lockdown also well i would say you know the uh, the entire uh, diagnostic workup of patients with, uh, with, with presumed covid is still unsettled mm -hmm. uh, we have had problems with the uh, the pcr test the rt pcr that we do for diagnosis of uh, of uh, active disease, mm -hmm. which has its own problem because it is not very sensitive. You know, it's only 63% sensitive. And uh, uh, the, the testing criteria has always been a subject of debate with us uh, in, for the last few weeks. And this, uh, the antibody tests, which is the antibodies that appear in blood, they usually appear a week later right. and sometimes 10 days later. And their primary function that was expected of them of tests, which were to test, uh, which were uh, to pick up people's antibodies in blood, were for surveillance purpose. Exactly. Which would allow one to know what is the burden of disease in a particular community, or in certain sets of high-risk people like health workers, right. or people who come with a specific uh, severe respiratory infection uh, in a to, a to hospitals of this country. Would allow this would have allowed us to plan. First, who will be the first line health workers who would be looking at problems uh, when people come to hospitals uh, from among the large mass of uh, health workers to choose the, the, the most protected people. Mm -hmm. The second thing was it would, it would have allowed us, uh, you know, the trends in uh, the burden of disease in a particular district would have allowed us to choose in a more granular method, uh, processes of social distancing, including lockdowns, and right. controlling, you know, uh, movements of people, um, movement of goods, and uh, also uh, allow us to take other public health decisions about how many beds to create, how many people to be, uh, be how many beds do we need for quarantining, how many beds we require for isolation, and so forth. But uh, now this might push back these things. Uh, this right. uh, problem about kids might push it back by a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But um, I hope, uh, at least I know that in Chhattisgarh the the antibody test kits from South Korea have, uh, as late of, as yesterday, have shown promise. And uh, in fact, uh, Chhattisgarh is going ahead with this surveillance methods within right. uh, within uh, this week itself. Right. Uh, uh, doing it at a district level now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to elaborate a bit more on this process, because many states are thinking about easing some restrictions, and that's probably the most uh, significant question on people's minds. So. Uh, how do we see uh, this uh, the lockdown slowly being eased? First of all, are we in a position to think of it, or at least are most states in a position to think of it? And if we are, how exactly? So, what should be the medical process involved? Well, I think it's uh, locking up a set of people uh, or entire people of a, of a country or a mm -hmm. state. Uh, actually, is positing the problems of life exactly uh, and health uh, due to. Uh, uh, COVID and non-COVID illnesses against livelihoods of people, which are itself an important determinant of you know health uh, status of people. So uh, uh, and therefore people have had to do you know a balancing act uh, about uh, not allowing major effect on uh, livelihoods, so that people's other patterns, other systems of life, uh, you know other aspects of life, uh, which means education, means future. Uh, of people, uh, actual everyday eating and you know uh, other needs are looked at, and at the same time strike a balance at a, at a societal level to accept a certain amount of morbidity and mortality 
uh, due to covid and non covid illnesses so in fact uh, this is uh, so there in this case uh, you know knowing about the burden of disease in a particular area uh, and calling them as uh, by various names uh, which have their own problems like hot spots right. and containment areas red zones and stuff have problems but you know we i would say overall we we are not in a situation we are not a country with a very formal economy with a lot of people who uh, live from uh, from day to day that we cannot have a like uh, lockdown uh, that we have had now for 40 odd days mm-hmm. continuing for any longer right. we will have to go into a mitigation strategy where we minimize the damage that is mm-hmm. done to people's health because of covid related illnesses or due to even the non covid related illnesses we don't want people to not uh, we don't want to give people a choice that either you die of covid or you die of tuberculosis which is not looked after exactly so we need our health systems to start running again as well as we need our like people's uh, economies to you know uh, to be uh, not damaged any more than what they have been done in the last uh, few weeks right and i would argue that we should be able to accept uh, the uh, a certain amount of damage uh, due to covid related illnesses uh, to happen you minimize that to the extent that we can do with our whatever our health system are right. but not damage other reasons which are more in our control which is like livelihoods and non covid related healthcare absolutely and finally so there is a question of once for instance we do start looking at see easing some restrictions there is a possibility of the number of cases uh, rising or if not massively by a steady rate the number of cases still is continuing to rise so there is also the question of say at a time when uh, say restrictions are eased what kind of quarantine measures Uh, do we do as a government as a society do we look at instituting because uh, how do we for instance sort of ensure that certain sections are not cracked down upon very strongly so that the rest of society continues as normal so what kind of measures and uh, what kind of thinking needs to go into that i would say that first we should be uh, protecting people from non covid illnesses uh, you know uh, consequences the bad consequences of people dropping out of treatment for tuberculosis not mm-hmm. being able to seek treatment for tuberculosis right or people's treatments uh, for cancers uh, not being disrupted any more uh, their treatment for other chronic illnesses like diabetes uh, hypertension asthma arth- joint diseases mental illnesses not being disrupted any more and pe- and uh, women and child health childhood illnesses problems should be looked after as well Uh, as they were or even better than what we were what we had before we started having the problem of covid right but at the same time i would say that we need to allow people uh, to be able to access these services which would which would mean that we have to have public transport going again exactly. uh, going on we need our other auto rickshaws we need our buses we need our trains to run so that people can you know access care Mm-hmm. how many people in this country can uh, travel by their own transport to public services to public health services i don't think it's more than 20% of people who can afford to either use a cycle of their own or a bus or a mm-hmm. or, or or a car or motorcycle of their own most people require depend upon public transport to be able to access health care certainly yeah. secondary level health care so we need uh, uh, public transport and i think that itself and in the absence of you know allowing uh, Uh, big gatherings of people we should pretty much open everything else where people i think are sensible enough to be able to maintain whatever uh, distancing that they can do from each other as well as look after their own uh, hygiene uh, uh-huh. of hands and of their faces so that they they protect themselves from this uh, virus that we have in our midst right. but at the same time not allow other problems to happen right thank you so much dr yogesh for talking to us In our next segment we look at the numbers around the epidemic and modeling which is making estimates about the spread of a disease like covid-19 now this may sound like a complicated subject but in reality it is essential for the governments and the people as it helps determine what policies they will take we talked to news clicks prabir purkaista on the various types of models that have been used across the world to predict the spread of covid-19 and the benefits and flaws of each of these mathematical methods let's look at the models themselves and i will go to the three class of models we have one is the most popular epidemiological model we have 
which is called the SAR model or the SEIR model. It's basically a variant of the same. Then you have what are called data driven models, which depend just on data and then extrapolate from that. Then you have what are called network models. Now I'm going to go over each of the, them and show you what they tend to predict. Now, if you look at what is called the SAR model, a simple form of it, this is susceptibles, infected, removed. You see those who are susceptible, you see them. Out of that, a certain number will get infected. Out of that, a certain number will get removed. Removed means you either get well or you die. Both cases, you go out of the pool of susceptibles and infected because those who are removed, presumably those who have got cured, they are unlikely to get infected again because they have antibodies. This is a simple SAR model that we have. As I said, we have been playing with this model as well. There is a Basel University model, which is there on the net, which has been widely used by people to test out various hypotheses. Now, it tends to have what is called a Gaussian structure. If you see, it goes up exponentially and it then flattens for a short period. It comes down also equally rapidly. And it's a kind of symmetry. Going up and coming down seems to happen at the same rate. Now, if you, if you look at what the charts we are seeing, and we have also the China chart, which is also there, you will see this is not exactly what we are seeing. We seem to see a much slower flattening. And we don't see a sharp coming down as yet. Now, if we look at the parameters that are there in the SAR model, they depend essentially in what's called the reproductive number of the disease. Now, there is something called R0, the basic reproduction number, which we seem to find out well after the pandemic is over. So we make some conjectures about the number. But if you look at the reproductive rates of various diseases, which are infectious diseases, you will find, for instance, the very highly infectious diseases or measles, one person would really infect 16 persons. This is the reproductive rate. How many does one person infect? And you had, for instance, smallpox, one person could infect six. Now, when you come to COVID-19, asterisk mark only shows that this is a figure which you really don't know as of now. So there it's being said as 2.5. That means one person infects Two and a half persons, which means really that uh, two people would infect five people. Now, if you look at, for instance, SARS, SARS seems to have a higher infect infection rate. But again, these are open to questioning. So I'm not going to get into this. This means as long as this reproduction rate is there, the numbers will go up. They will double at a certain rate. And doubling could be at the rate of four to eight days. You could double. Now, what happens is, of course, human beings do not follow the uh, path of not doing anything. So there is also a social reaction. There is also an administrative reaction. So the reproduction rates fall. And of course, then you have a flattening of the curve. But the curve, how it flattens, all of that depends on the reproductive rate. So this curve does not follow the kind of path structure of, the, of what we saw here which was actually an influenza epidemic. People don't really do much once the epidemic is there or not there. And then you do see a certain kind of Gaussian structure. This is unlikely to happen here. And this is what we are saying. Yes, exponential rate, yes. There is a flattening, which is not exponential growth. And then the slow come down. Now, this other models that have been used are what are called data-driven models. That means you look at past data. And using the parameters that you get from the current data and the past data, say if you take last 15 days rate of growth, and you say, well, let's put that as the current rate of growth, and what we will see in the future, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks in the future. This is one of the models, for instance, which Hindu has quoted, which is being used or which is being, uh, which is available on the net, and which people have been using to say, well, you know, so many people are going to fall ill by May, or some of the people, for instance, the government have claimed, based on whichever model they might be using, that how many people would have fallen ill if we had not taken action. So they have sort of patted themselves on the back, saying very high numbers would have been involved if we hadn't done anything. All of this we really don't know. And if you are dependent on the past, 
then you have a scenario where you don't really know what is going to happen in the future because that really didn't happen in the past. So as some people have said, these kind of models are like driving on your road, looking at the rear view mirror. And so if the road behind is pretty nice, you say, hey, even if there's a deep, deep drop ahead, you'll say, hey, we, I can really accelerate because the road was really empty. Now, this is the problem of uh, data driven models. It assumes that you know nothing about the disease and all we have the data and we predict on the basis of it. And that's, that's uh, well, if you don't know really anything, that may be the only way to go about it. But this is a, epidemics are something we know. So should we be really doing that is the question. And I come to probably the more useful models, which are still relatively new in uh, studying of epidemics. This is what's called a transmission network model, which means that the human beings, though they are really uh, connected, they're not connected to each other uniformly. This is one of the problems with the SCIR model. It assumes all human beings to be treated the same way, as if they connect to everybody the same way. And therefore, you can treat them as a kind of homogeneous, uniform set of people with equal collections to everybody in the world. Now, that's really not how human people are connected. Human, humans are connected in that you are connected in a smaller cluster, bigger cluster. You have your circle of friends, you have a circle of work friends. So one person may be connected loosely to a number of other clusters. And he may have one big cluster, which may be where he stays, where he works, or it could be his friends. Now, this network, when you model, there are some dif the differences between this and the SCIR kind of model. This claims that you will see not exactly the kind of Gaussian distribution we saw, but what are called power law distributions. That means they have a structure when you rise fast, then you flatten, and then you come down slowly, which is more or less what we seem to see today in the epidemics as well. So it does seem to bear out, which would be normal uh, also amongst human beings to think about, that this is really a structure which you should be looking at when you're looking at epidemics because human beings do connect like this and therefore the maths of this should tell us what is the likely scenario. So there is the Barbasi lab which is there in the US. They have a model which has done work on this and they have also done predictions though their predictions are also pretty high and again it's a question of what is the prediction for? Is it the prediction for saying that this is what you know, will happen, right. or this is for saying this will happen if you don't do anything. So though they have taken mitigation into their model, in spite of that, they have shown that the mitigation didn't take place, numbers would be much higher. They also show figures which would say about, and you know, the month down the road, or even based on the past data, what we have seen, the death figure seems to be twice or thrice what we are seeing at the moment. So they are showing figures coming down, coming down well below what a Gaussian model would predict, but nevertheless, they seem to be also showing fairly high figures. Uh, but as I said, the purpose of the figures are not to predict, but the purpose of figures are only to say what kind of impact can happen and what is there for the actions you should take. Right. Now, the US has gone for uh, another approach. Not that US has gone for another approach. The Science Magazine has taken, for instance, 19 modelers and then say, well, if I approximate all of them together and have an average of it, right. what will happen? Now, if you see the figures that, they, they, that is there, now, if it's a short range of figures, one month prediction, first May to first June, 30 days, for instance, then the prediction figures don't seem to vary so significantly. But this is the lower bound. If you take the more likely numbers, you will see a much greater spread from 50,000 to 150,000 other predictions. That means one is to three. And if you take the largest possibility of deaths, every of these predictions give an outside bound, high, medium, low, right. okay? Most likely, maybe high, maybe low, okay? If you take that bound, then you see some very much larger variations. You can have bounds from, as I said, about something like, 55 to 60,000 
two predictions as large as 400,000. Now, how good are taking all this and averaging is still the question or choosing a kind of, okay, let's predict it will be 70,000 because most likely numbers people are saying is between 150 to 50. So let's choose 75. Well, those are the things you can go with. And in the absence of anything which is really accurate, maybe that's the only way to go. And the other thing, of course, is look at current data and look at, based on that, take some decisions. Right. That's the other way to go. So I think this is where we are. The right. essential issue is, for, unfortunately, we don't really know. So I will come back to the chart again, which we discussed earlier, and say what we should really look at this chart and see where we are and take intelligent decisions based on the current rate of growth, which you can actually see in this chart quite clearly. I think this is the only solution that we have at the moment. Right. So Prabhupada, another key question is regarding the uh, importance of mo how modeling when it comes to, uh, say, communication as well as far as the public is concerned. So as of now, we really don't know the thinking behind most governments, what kind of modeling they're actually using and what kind of uh, predictions. We just know the final stage, that is the actions each government is recommending. So is it also essential that governments also be a bit more open about what kind of calculations they have in mind? I think transparency is a key issue. And along with transparency is the other issue. There has to be a kind of numeracy, uh, shall we say, by which people understand numbers. People understand science. This is as much an exercise of educating your people mm -hmm. about what an epidemic is, how it spreads, what are the likely effects, and then explain what you are doing and why you are doing it. Now, all of this means that you go into what a pandemic is, how it spreads, and why, therefore, we need to take certain measures and not use model as models as kind of the wisdom of God. Right. And that we have an oracle which has said this, and in 15 days it hasn't happened, that means we have been successful in aver averting this disaster. Now, we have no way of validating this exercise because, of course, you cannot say, let's not do anything and see what's going to happen. You know, so I think we do have that problem about this kind of models, which are not predictive models of the kind we have seen Einstein's theory of gravity. You mm -hmm. could see an astronomical event and say, hey, it confirmed what Einstein had said 50, 60 years back. This is not those kind of models. These models are meant only for predicting what should not happen. Right. And therefore, the science of it going into that is far more important and why we are doing a certain set of measures. And instead of that, if you make it into some kind of mumbo jumbo on which, you know, then you use for justifying what you have done. This, of course, is a very easy way of uh, avoiding discussion, which right. most governments are doing. Exactly. Even the UK government, we don't know who's advising them. Right. The Indian gov government at the moment is completely opaque. We do not know who are the people who are advising the prime minister. We do not know who is being consulted. We do not know what models are being used, or we don't even know what tenders are being floated for right. what purpose and who is getting the order and at what price. Now, all of these are coming out in court cases because exactly. vendors are fighting, exactly. not because there have been sudden uh, descent into mm -hmm you know, transparency by the government. Right. What's happened is people are quarreling, they're going to court, and then, of course, these figures are coming out. And the figures are quite damning. We are seeing markups which are 250 to 300% and testing kits. Right. Yes. Exactly. So those are the kind of issues where I think we need far more transparency, whether in the United States or in India or in the United Kingdom or anywhere in the world. Right. And I think without doing that, the people will not get involved in the fight against the pandemic, which is what we need. We do not need a coercive state forcing people to do things. We need, we need participative government. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for talking to us. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.